Welcome back my friends. Today we have got a plinking bullet to test for 223-556. This is a 55 grain full metal jacket boat tail from 223bulkbullets.com. A viewer asked me about these bullets. I cannot find where he asked me. I don't remember if it was on Facebook or YouTube or email or where it was. So whoever recommended these to me, I'm sorry, I can't remember who you were. I know it was a long time viewer that I should know, but uh, I couldn't find our conversation on the topic. The funniest thing about this bullet is their website. They just kind of whip it out and play with it for page after page after page. Let's uh, read a few choice quotes from the website here. The finest quality and most affordable bulk bullets made in the USA. Bob's Bullets, Bob Bob's, oh no. It's one of those possessive plural words that ends with an apostrophe. Bob, Bob's, Bob's, Bob, Bob's, 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 Bob's. All right, we'll just stick with Bob's. Just know that there's more than one Bob included in that Bob's. But why do they need two names? Are they 223bulkbullets.com or are they Bob's Bullets? What do I call it? Do I go with the long name? Like every time I refer to the projectile, I will say the Bob's is his bullets from 223bulkbullets.com. I don't know. We'll have to work that out as we go here. But yes, so this website just, uh, well, let's, let's keep reading. Bob's Bullets produces only the finest quality, match grade, bulk 223 bullets, reloading supplies for demanding target shooters and competitive marksmen. You will not find a more superior bulk reloading bullet at this price anywhere. The precision and forethought that goes into our manufacturing process gives Bob's bulk 223 bullets the very best accuracy available on the reloading market. You're pumping me up here, guys. You're selling me a freaking eight cent 556 bullet. You know, we can tone this down a little bit because all you're really doing at this point is setting me up for massive disappointment. Reading these, I mean, these, these should shoot like Sierra Match Kings. So we haven't made it over. They've got a page on the site called Why Use Bob's Bullets, where they kind of just continue the fellatio here. Uh, there's one bullet point that kind of caught my eye. It says, our high quality total copper full metal jacket reduces bullet jump and increases speed and accuracy while reducing barrel wear. That bit about bullet jump kind of just jumped out at me. Like, whoa, what's that about? So we're gonna circle around, we're gonna investigate that a little bit. The rest of the crap seems like hyperbole. So that's where we sit. We've got this bullet with these grandiose claims. So we're gonna give them a try and see if they'll shoot. There is a little bit of a weird marked mark uh, near the tip of the bullet. Show you some of these guys, just that little round mark up there near the nose. All of the bullets have it and all of the pictures that I can see on their website, they have it. So I guess their dies just, uh, Leave that little mark on the bullet. I don't know if it's designed or if it's just a thing or whatever. I don't think it's gonna be a problem. It was just something that jumped out at me. Before we get into load data, let's look at our overall length. Cause that bullet jump claim on their website kind of uh, piqued my interest. What I wanted to do was just determine what our maximum overall length is with this bullet in my gun. So what I use is, you know, a little case, just like you've probably seen me do a lot of times, is a little case that has, uh, that has been resized and then just had a slit cut down the neck with, the, with a Dremel tool. And you barely put a bullet in and then you finish seating the bullet in the gun, right? Like the, the push it in until it hits the rifling and then it'll just push the bullet deeper into the case. And if you do this over and over and over, you get a lot of weird readings. This is not really the best way to do this reading, but it's good enough for the standard reloader like us, right? We're not trying to split hairs here. We just kind of want to get an idea, make sure we're not going to jam the bullet into the lands as we get to reloading. So I went through this process 10 to 15 times or so with this bullet and used multiple bullets. And I found that in my gun, which is a white oak armament barrel chambered in, chambered in uh, 223 Wild, that I hit the lands right about a 2.265 inch overall length. A lot of, you know, like I said, there's a little bit of uh, mushiness here with these readings. I got a lot of uh, 
numbers in that upper 2.26 area, 2.267, 2.268, up basically between 2.265 and 2.270 was the uh, number I was getting most uh, most often. So this is gonna work out just about perfect, right? Because our maximum overall length because of the magazine is 2.260. If I'm hitting the lands at 2.265, that means I could stay magazine length and be only five thousandths off the lands. That's pretty dope. That can lead to some accuracy, no doubt about it. So I took a couple pictures here. I've got one with the bullet at 2.260, you know, seated to a depth of 2.260 or an overall length of 2.260. Um, so you see the, uh, the cantalure is not quite down to the case mouth, but it looks like there's plenty of bullet inside that neck. You know, I think we could uh, seat the bullets to this depth and be in pretty good shape if we wanted to. So the next picture is an overall length of 2.235. I think this is what I'm gonna go with as kind of our, uh, as, as our overall length number. Lines up nicely with the cantalure, very nice bullet depth and you know contact between the bearing surface and the neck of the case. It all looks good. So I think 2.235 is what I'll go with for the standard overall length. Now, that should give us about a 30 thousandths jump to the lands of my rifling, which is not too shabby, not too shabby at all. So out of curiosity, I pulled out some 55 grain Hornady Full Metal Jacket boat tail bullets. Here's a look at those two bullets side by side. They're really not close, right? Pretty drastically different boat tail design, different ogive shape. So this is not a clone of what we've come to normally find for bulk uh, 55 grain bullets. Now, whenever I take the Hornady bullet and do a max overall length measurement in my gun, I come up at right around 2.3 inches. So that, that basically says for any given overall length, the Hornady will have about 35 thousandths of additional jump than this Bob's bullet. Whether any of this is going to matter, whether it's going to translate into good accuracy, we don't know yet, but you know. That line on the website just made me want to look at this a little bit closer. Now, like I mentioned, my gun has got a 223 wild chamber, which by my ignorant understanding of the situation, it's got the shorter throat of a 223. So what I did is I grabbed my Colt LE 6920, which is a 556 chambered AR, and I tested the maximum overall length in that gun. It was 2.365 exactly a hundred thousandths of additional jump in my 556 chamber when compared to my 223 wild chamber. So that's about, that's kind of where we stand. I think this might, uh, this might explain something. You know, if, if we're going to see some good accuracy, this uh, limited jump might be part of it. I don't know, but I think, well, okay. Now let's move on to discuss load data, right? Bob's bullets doesn't exactly have a loading manual for you. So you're on your own for load data. So the first thing I did, pulled out the good old Hornady manual. They always have a nice selection of powders, you know, in, in the common calibers. This is their 223 55 grain section. And I just kind of looked down the list and said, yeah, you know, I feel like shooting some popular powders today. So what I've picked out is Hodgton H335 and Hodgton Varget. I'm thinking these guys should do okay. They're both in the Hornady manual. And also the other thing, which is the greatest thing Hodgson has ever thought to do in the universe, right? They put load data right on the fricking powder bottle. So when you're standing at the store, wondering what in the hell this powder's for, it gives you some idea. That's so awesome. I wish every bottle of powder had that, or at least like some of the accurate, uh, you know, the Western powders, accurate and Ram shop powders. I think they have a little blurb that to tell you, you know, which, uh, which cartridges it works best in or whatever. But yeah, with Alliant, you're just, there's no information at all on the bottle and you're just left wondering. So we've got load data for 55 grain, 223 bullets on both of the labels here. So while it's not perfect, it's not a direct specific load data for Bob's 223 bulk bullets, it's still a lot of things to take into consideration. We've already looked and, you know, we saw that that Hornady design is a lot different than this design. So we don't want to just grab our max loads, do the same thing in uh, with Bob's bullets and hope we don't blow our face off. We can be a little bit smarter than that. The other thing that's on our side, this is just a plinking load. We don't need fricking crazy screaming velocity. We just need good function with our guns and good accuracy. That's what it's all about. 
So we'll be keeping our max charges well below what they show on the bottle and what uh, even Hornady shows, which is kind of has a re uh, has a reputation of being a little bit conservative on their data. So this is this is all good news for us. We're shooting an unknown first time. That's perfectly good. What I came up with is with Hodgson H335, I want to shoot 21 grains up to 23 grains. We'll shoot half grain increments. So the bottle shows a max charge of 25.3 grains. So we're a couple grains below what the bottle says. And the Hornady manual shows a max charge of 23.2 grains. So we're just barely under the Hornady number. But I really like that starting charge of 21.0. That's gonna be nice and light and we should be able to work these up. Half grain, half grain jumps are, 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 are pretty big, but I'm thinking that we'll, we'll still be okay. We should be able to work up and catch it if we run into a major pressure issue. The second powder is Hodgton Varget. I wanna shoot 24 to 26 grains. Same deal, half grain increments. The bottle shows 27.5 grains. So we're a, a, a grain and a half below what the bottle says was max for that bullet. And Hornady, goes up to 26.4 grains. So we're 0.4 grains under what Hornady calls max. And I think that's gonna be good. So looking at the max overall length with this bullet and finding out that we're really pretty darn close to my lands, I wanna do one more series of loads and I wanna do an overall length of 2.260. And I wanna do it with Varget. We'll shoot the exact same loads, 24 to 26 grains, but I want to do it at that 2.260 inch overall length. That's only going to be about five thousandths off my lands. And I think it'll be fascinating to see what the difference is between the uh, 2.235 inch overall length and the 2.260 inch overall length. For primers, I forgot to pull out primers. There we are. We'll go ahead and stick with what we know, what we uh, use a lot here with 223, the CCI number 41 primers. Having said that, I do want to do some, uh, some primer testing pretty soon with 223. Because now that we got a really nice shooting platform with our white oak armament barrel, it might be time to start looking into uh, the different primers. Kind of like we have previously in 300 Blackout, I want to kind of bring a similar test to uh, 223. But that's not today. Today is all about Bob's bullets. And we are using CCI number 41 primers. Brass is going to be FC 223, so Federal 223 brass, same batch of brass we've been using for quite some time. And here's the deal. 223 fully prepped. That is a damn lie. This brass is not at all prepped. All it, ha it has been uh, fired, deep primed, and wet tumbled. So this stuff needs sized, possibly trimmed, and all of that junk. So today's video is going to be an extended, an extended look. We're going to look a little closer. I'm going to walk you guys through my brass prep here. So this video is going to be a little bit long. We're kind of going to whip it out and play with it here today, right? This is going to be the, the long format. I've gotten into that 20 to 25 minute bullet testing video range where, you know, things are compacted a little bit. This one's going to be old school, man. We might hit an hour and a half. I don't know, but we're just going to take our time. We're going to show stuff. Those of you who maybe uh, haven't started reloading yet, want a little bit more detail, this is going to be your video. So we've got a bunch of brass prep to do here before we get into any powdering or bulleting or any of that. Oh, one thing really quick on the Bob's bullets. They did come packaged just in a, uh, in a bag in a little box. I'm totally fine with it. It was kind of splitting at the seams a little bit and, and definitely full. But when I'm getting an eight cent bullet, I don't exactly... Uh, expect nice packaging. So I just popped them into a, uh, yep, a leftover bullet box. We've all got these laying around, don't we? I did purchase the 250 pack. So I paid a lot for these. I paid 14.4 cents a piece. The price drops very quickly as you go up in uh, quantity. For 500 pieces, it's like 10 and a half cents. And then if you order a thousand pieces, then you're under eight cents. 7.9 cents if you order a thousand, 7.7 cents if you order 5,000. I just didn't want to end up with a uh, thousand crappy bullets if these things suck. Hopefully they don't suck, man. Hopefully at the end of this video, 
I'm looking back at all of my hateful and cynical comments, and we, we can call me a dumbass for not believing that these are going to be awesome bullets. But I'm just, I'm still, we're going in skeptical, brother. We're, we're going in skeptical. Brass prep is El Numero Uno. As I mentioned before, I have already popped the primers out and run these guys through the wet tumbler. So the vast majority of the goo has been removed. The next step is going to be resizing these guys. And what I like to do for resizing, I've got these big, I've got these big plastic bins like this. There we go. Brass in the bin. And then I've got some lanolin case lube that I made incorrectly. You can see that it settles a little bit. I bought the wrong lanolin. So I have to eh, shake mine up a little bit every time. Actually shake quite vigorously. You're supposed to buy the liquid lanolin, which uh, mixes a whole lot easier. I bought the non-liquid lanolin because I'm an idiot. So that's it. A couple of sprays onto our brass, and then we just shake them around to get all of that evenly coated. Sometimes, you know, later on, throw another spritz in there. But these lanolin lubes, which, you know, you don't have to make your own. You can buy Dillon and Frankfurt Arsenal, both make uh, lanolin-based case lubes like this that you just spray on. This is good for bulk stuff. So I need to let the alcohol dry off of these guys, shake them around a little bit more, and then we'll be ready for resizing here in just a second. All right, my 223 dies are redding. This is my uh, small base full length sizing die. There it is. Brass goes up in there. If there's a primer in there, that little guy pops it out and this guy's gonna size that case down to down to size so it should fit in pretty much any chamber. So with very few exceptions, resizing dies are installed and set up the same way. We've got our Redding number 10 shell holder in the press. Nice fit with our 223 brass. So like I said, the resizing dies are all pretty much set up the same. You screw it down, until the bottom of the die touches the shell holder. And then you drop your shell holder and go an additional eh, quarter turn or so. You kind of can feel it whenever all of the slop is definitely getting worked out of the press here as the ram comes to the top and you feel a little bit of a cam camming action with your, uh, with your press handle. You tighten it down and that's good. All right, the biggest danger at this step are stuck cases. And I have stuck many a case in my day. I'm not gonna deny it, but with the lanolin lubes, it generally does a really nice job. So up and down, no problems whatsoever. We wanna look for dents in the shoulder because if you go too heavy on the lube, the lube pulls up inside of the die around that neck and you get hydraulic dents in your neck from the pulled up uh, lube, which is not good. Which it's, it's, not, it's not like a devastating problem. You can go ahead and shoot them normally and it'll fire form right out and you'll be just fine. But you wanna avoid them if you can. I usually get some, we get a few. Cause I like to be, you know, I'd rather be slightly over lubed than slightly under lubed. That's the one problem with this die. Let me pop it out real quick and I'll show you. If you look around the threading on this die, there's nothing to see there, right? Yeah, that's exciting. Let me grab a, yeah, I think my RCBS 300 blackout die has one. Let me show you what it's got. See that little hole? As far as I know, that's what that's for, is to relieve pressure inside of there around that shoulder so that excess lube can have a little place to go or get some relief. And instead of denting your shoulder, the air and stuff escapes out of there. That's always been my understanding of the situation. And because of that, like I, well, 300 Blackout doesn't really have enough shoulder to dent anyway. So that may not be a uh, very good uh, 
example, but with this 223 dot, I do get a lot more dented shoulders than in a lot of my other cartridges. All right, so now it's time to rock and roll and try to get through all these guys. You can generally get into a flow and move them pretty quickly here. I do see a little bit of uh, buildup going on in there. Let me do a couple more and I'll show you real quick. Here we go. See the white crap? That's excess lube from up inside the die. That's generally a uh, kind of a bit of a little bit of a warning sign that you're heading towards some shoulder dents before too long. So I may have gone a little bit overboard with the lube. What I've done in the past, if I really over lubed and it became a problem is you can just grab a, uh, grab a rag or a paper towel. There we go. So this one, and just kind of wipe that neck and shoulder portion just a little bit. A lot of times just doing it every, every few rounds can help out a little bit. So that's really all there is to resizing brass. So let me get through these guys and then we'll move on to trimming or at least we'll check to see whether we need trimming or not. I think we're probably going to need to trim. It's about that time. So I'll see you guys here in just a minute. So one thing I could mention here, during the resizing process, this is when your brass is going to stretch. So you never want to trim your brass before resizing unless, uh, unless you know what you're doing. I don't know, maybe somehow you can uh, justify that or make it work in your process. But as a general rule, you want to trim after sizing. And I'll show you one here. Just. Uh, grab ourselves a random piece of brass. All right, this guy's very short, 1.735. So let's resize it. Okay, 1.744. So this guy stretched almost 10 thousandths. Let's do another one here. Okay, this one's 1.742. See, 1.750 is the normal trim length with 223. I think these, uh, there you go, 1.747. We'll look at them a little bit closer here once I finish resizing, but these may not need it. These may not need any trimming. All right, so I've just finished, you know, finished up our resizing and now we need to determine whether or not these need trimmed. And it doesn't look like they are. Our, our trim length with 223 is 1.750, right? An inch and three quarters, pretty easy to remember. And the maximum length, 1.760, 10 thousandths longer. So most of these are actually still short of trim length. Most of them are coming out at this 1.7, 45 to 1.750. So I can get at least one more firing before we need to trim these guys. One thing that I should mention is the, the resizing process is really, this is your, your uh, best opportunity to spot damaged or uh, screwed up cases and get them out. And I actually did run into one had a case, went to resize it, and it felt very, very weird. There's no way for me to uh, explain it to you if you haven't experienced it. You just got to experience it. It'll just feel different. And 
I immediately took that case out and found a big old gnarly split neck. That's a good one too. So that is obviously a screwed up case. And not only, you know, this guy's going to get pulled out, but this now flag, this is the first neck failure I've had in this batch of brass, which I think we fired three or four times at this point, something like that. But it's now on my mind. And if I start seeing additional neck failures, maybe the next time through, we'll just pitch this this batch of brass and move on to something else. You know, 223 brass is too cheap to uh, shoot crappy brass. Yeah, that's the longest one I've seen. 1.756. Here's what I'm going to do. I don't want to measure every single one of these, but what I want to do is I'm going to put my calipers at 1.755. So that's five thousandths short of max. And I'm going to lock them down and then just use this as a gauge and just run them through here as quickly as I can and make sure that they all fit through. And any that don't, we'll go ahead and trim. So let me run through these real quick. Oh, we may have one already. Good. And then I'll, so that's a long, I'll just sit it over here to the side and we'll see how big that collection gets. All right, so we had exactly 20 pieces that did not fit through our 1.755 gauge. We had 10 that are actually over maximum length of 1.760. And then we had 10 that fell between that uh, 55 and 60 range. So let's just, let's go ahead and trim all of these guys. Now a small little batch, what would be perfect is the Lee case length gauge and shell holder kit. So I can, yeah, I have these for a lot of different uh, calibers. Like, yeah, there's one for 243. You guys didn't even know I reloaded 243. I'll have to do that someday. Problems I don't really have an exciting gun for 243. But okay, back to the original theme here. I do not have one for uh, 223, which sucks. This would be a really quick, easy, cheap way. We are going to use this big contraption instead. This is my uh, Frankfurt Arsenal case trim and prep center. All right, I got to get this beast set up. Good deal. You know, that's a pretty clean cut, but there are still some burrs on the inside and outside of the case mouth. So what I want to do next with these 20 is go ahead and use our uh, chamfer and deburring tools, which you can use handheld job like this, or if you've got one of these, you can use this. You might be asking yourself, why didn't he do this while he was trimming, right? Should have been trim and then chamfer. And the reason is because I'm an idiot. Yeah, so at this point, these 20 cases can rejoin their family here. And now we know that none of them, none of them are over max length. Uh, let's wipe up our brass shavings real quick. So this, at this point, you would also want to any military crimps on your primers. All of this brass has already been reloaded. So we did that long ago, but you know, sometimes you get a little crimp around the primer that they use, you see it in pretty much all 5.56 ammo and some 223 ammo like this stuff, this FC 223 head stamp had crimps, or at least some of them did. And it's not really something we need to worry about. If you wanted to, uh, well, I guess I should talk about the plan for my brass. Like my, there's 50 million ways to do this and they're all right. Whatever works best for your workflow. What I want to get to is a big jug of brass that is ready for primer powder and bullets that I can just sit back here, grab 50, do a video, and then move on to the next 50. 
So the problem with the brass as it sits right now is it is still completely covered in lanolin. And a lot of people will claim that the, the lanolin doesn't really cause any problems with uh, contaminating your primers or powder. I haven't tested that enough or at all myself to, uh, to be able to say one way or the other. What I like to do is go ahead and put these back into the wet tumbler just for about 15 minutes, really hot water, you know, as, as hot as I can get tap water, a bunch of soap, a good little shot of Limashine, and it strips off that lanolin really nicely in about 15 minutes. Now the nice chamfer and deburr that we just did on our newly trimmed cases, I don't know if that's one of them or not, but when, when it goes through the wet tumbler one more time, that's going to get messed up a little bit. So I don't want to go through the whole lot at this point and uh, chamfer and deburr the case mouth. I want to do that last. I want to do that after we get rid of the lanolin on them because I've really found that uh, the chamfered inside the case mouth gets boogered up enough to where the bullets don't seat quite as nicely if you uh, have tumbled it after you uh, chamfered it. Does that make any sense at all? I don't know, but that's where we're headed in this process. But if you needed to do any other stuff, now would be the time, like uh, uniforming primer pockets. If you wanted to uniform your primer pockets, if you wanted to uh, deburr your flash holes, you know, like eh, get rid of the burrs in the flash holes. Anything else that causes loose brass shavings, I want to get at, get out of the way now before we run them through the tumbler one more time. But in my case, there's nothing left. These guys are ready to go back into the tumbler to get rid of the lanolin. So I'll see you guys after that's done. Okay, where were we? I've been loading 300 blackout for a couple hours, so I'm a little lost. We trimmed the pieces of brass that needed trimmed, and then we put everything back in the tumbler to get the lanolin off of it. That's what we did. So, the only other function I wanna do, or the only other operation I wanna do on these guys is to uh, chamfer the inside of the case mouth. Most of these, the uh, the outside is fine. Like, unless I see, you know, it's basically still chamfered from last time. So I'm gonna hit the inside just to, you know, so the bullets seat nice and smooth, but the outside, I'm only gonna hit it if the, if the case mouth is a little bit boogered up. And it's very easy to feel boogered up case mouths as you run through them, you know, you'll feel it grab and stick and it'll feel weird. But the ones with, uh, the ones that are in good shape, I'm just going to leave alone. So I need to hit, what do we, we need 75 rounds. We already talked about all the load data, right? I think we did. Yeah, we talked about all the load data. We talked about shooting the additional 25 shots with Varget at 2.260 inches of overall length. So yeah, I think I've run out of stuff to talk about here. So let me get these 75 cases ready to go and we'll be ready for primers. All right, we are gonna be using my RCBS and priming tools, so we need to get primers into this guy. I need 75 primers and I need to get it from two different packages, so this is always fun. So there's 60 coming out of this guy. Flip it over. Oh. Yeah. All right, there's one package down. Haven't spilled anything yet. Okay, another few. I'm a couple short. There we go. I think that's the right count, hopefully. Shake them up to flip them over. There's always one. Get out of there. Bit. Then you try to put this on without them flipping over on you again, which is nearly impossible. But sometimes if you get it just right and go fast. Nope, that's what you normally end up with is they flip back over and then you gotta kinda 
pry it up a little bit and shake it. This is a, uh, it's a source of great frustration for me. There we go. All right, I think they're all pointing the right way. You know what I think I'm gonna do? I'm, I'm getting a little bit tired of hand priming. I love hand priming. That's what I always, I've always done is primarily hand priming. But I think I wanna get one of those Lee bench priming jobs. Those are pretty cheap and look like they would do a nice job. At least I think so. A couple things you're looking out for when you're priming. Well, it's another chance to handle the brass, so you want to look for splits and stuff that may have uh, got past you during the resizing process. You're looking for primer pockets that are sloppy. Like They can't all be perfect, right? Especially when we're using range pickup brass and stuff like that. Sometimes... Uh, They don't all have the same tightness, but any that are very loose, where it feels like the primer just falls into the pocket and bottoms out with hardly any force, you wanna go ahead and call that piece of brass, throw it in the trash, remove that live primer, throw it in the trash. And priming brass is all about feeling it, kind of feeling it go in, not forcing it. There we go, and you, you feel it bottom out just give it some good pressure. Drag your finger across it to make sure it uh, seated deep enough. And that's kind of how I do primers. Not much else to say about that. So as soon as I can get through this, this will be kind of the normal state I normally start at in my recent bullet testing videos is the brass prep's pretty much done and we're ready for powder and bullets. So that's next. I'll see you guys when we're ready to start weighing powder. Okay, H335 is going to be our first powder. And I'm going to use my powder measure to throw them close and then trickle them the rest of the way up. So usually when I'm first setting my powder measure, what I'll do is take that opportunity to uh, fill up my trickler. Although this is 21.4, almost perfect. Got lucky there. Let's go in about a half a turn. Double check my zero on the scale there we go 20.4 all right so i guess we'll just have to fill up the powder measure that way and this stupid little scale it's a little scale that I reviewed just a couple videos ago. The W-A-O-W, -O -W, I don't know, whatever. The I'll leave a link eh, up there and at the end of this video. But uh, this scale is continuing to impress the crap out of me. I've been using it quite a bit here lately because I picked up a brand new Jump Pro 350. Hang on one second. Hang on. Actually, it's a Jim Pro 300. This guy, it was not cheap. It was a similar similar price to the Jim Pro 250 that I've been using for uh, for quite some time now. And I thought maybe this was a slightly bigger, beefier version. It's got a nicer display, so I wanted to try it out. It has been giving me problems every time I've tried to use it for reloading. I've had problems, so. I am pretty close. We're going to have a video on this guy really soon, and I'm, at this point, I'm thinking that this might not be a very good scale for reloading. So in the meantime, I've fallen back to using this little, uh, you know, $20 scale and my beam scale, and this thing is impressing the crap out of me. Like, it is always right on the money. It's zero does not drift. 
So, I mean, all of the good stuff that I said about it during the review, man, it's, it's, I'm just getting more and more fond of it. Maybe I'll have to do a follow-up video about it, giving it a little bit more praise, but it's always right on the money, and it is surprisingly good with for trickling. Like, it's been working pretty well for me. All right, what's our first load? 21 grains. I need a funnel. There's my funnel. Put that guy right there. Okay, that's 20.2. So let's get our trickler primed here a little bit. I'll tell you exactly what makes this scale really awesome is that it's fast. It is very fast to update. So where especially if you were trickling a large amount Actually, I'll just, I'll trickle this whole next charge. So like if you do really fast trickling, so if you're in the middle of trickling a ton and then you just stop, almost all the scales I have experience with, I mean, you've got probably a full second to wait before it really settles down and gives you the final reading. This thing keeps up with you. So it's very easy to kind of creep up on a number. See if I, how close I can get to uh, 21 in fast mode. There's 18. 19, 20.6. This probably would have been a lot more uh, compelling if I had given you a <laughs> look at the screen. Yep, 21.0. So it's just been impressing me. All right, so our first five charges are weighed out. I like to... Uh, Give it a visual inspection. Make sure we see that powder. Keep a little flashlight around. You're not going to spot small mistakes, but you'll definitely spot a double charge or an empty case. That's what you're looking for here. And everything looks fine. So what I like to do is go ahead and just seat bullets. If I'm, you know, hand weighing charges like this, once I get a row of charges. I like to go ahead and seat the bullets because I'm prone to spilling powder everywhere or mixing up somehow. It's just a lot easier for me to go row by row here. So let's see how these guys seat. Nice little boat tail. They, they sit down into the case pretty nicely. And I like that because, uh, you know, these five charges I've got weighed out, I like to, as soon as I visually inspect them, I like to go ahead and cover them with bullets. So your bullet seating die is where, you know, the individual die instructions vary quite a bit. With this Forster, we raise the ram and screw this guy in as far as we can. And then we back it out at least one turn is what the directions tell you. So there's one turn and then I like to go a little bit farther to where I can see the uh, see the labels on the uh, micrometer adjustment portion. So let's back this guy out a little bit. There we are. That ought to be plenty. And let's see. This may not even make contact. Nope. Doesn't feel like it even made contact. So I'm going to loosen up the course adjustment and screw it down until I feel it hit the bullet. There we go. And actually, I'm going to go a little bit farther. All right, we're not even close to the cantalure, so there's four full turns. That should be about 100 thousandths. So 2.235 was our initial number, right? Two point. Yep, we are 2.247. So we're only 12 thousandths away. So let's go ahead and just go 12 thousandths. 5, 10, 11, 12. There we go. Okay, let's see if we get consistent overall length numbers, if we seat a couple of them. The bullets feel very smooth when they're seating. 
Nothing to complain about there. Okay, 2.240. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Thirty-five. And thirty-seven. So let's go down three more thousandths. Because 2.238 was the most common number in there. Okay, thirty-seven. 35, perfect, 35, perfect, 32, a little short, and 33, good. So a couple thousandths of uh, variation there in overall length, which is nothing to be surprised or concerned about. So this is what it looks like there. We just barely got to the cantaloupe but I'm not too concerned about that. But you could definitely go a little bit shorter if you wanted a little bit uh, better alignment with the cantaloupe, but we're close enough. All right, now let's see, what do we got here? I think we will use the uh, the Lee Factory crimp die. This is one of those guys where the, the round goes up inside and then the four segments all close in together to kind of squeeze it right there at the case mouth. I always have to drop something. Oh crap. Fa found it, found it, found it. Did I bump the camera? Maybe not. Okay, whatever. But you get the idea of what's going on there, right? This bottom part squeezes up and those four segments all squeeze together. So setting these is a bit of a shaky science. What I found works best is to stand up and look down inside at those four segments and how much they are compressing and get it to where eh, they're closing a little over halfway. And then we'll go ahead and tighten down the lock ring. And from this point, it's about feel. So you run a case up in there slowly and easily and kind of try to get a feel for how much it pension is going on there. Feels like that's too heavy. Like I never made a full stroke. It just feels like it's uh, a little too heavy of a crimp. So let's lighten it up a little bit. Okay. So that, that gave a little bit of a squeeze. Yep, that works. So that's a, uh, it feels pretty light. And that's what I'm looking for. First five rounds are done. Okay, our H335 loads are done, so it's time to empty the powder measure. I guess I could show you that. Got a nice big funnel. Take the whole thing off the stand and dump it in. Now I'm super paranoid about powder getting stuck, you know, especially those uh, itty bitty little powders love to uh, get themselves stuck. So I generally like bang this thing around, kind of really make sure that everything's out of there. And that's pretty much it. All right, so H335 is ready to go off the table here and Varget and you know what I better grab a full pound there's probably enough here but eh, I don't want to get down to the end and need to switch lot numbers of powder so let me go get a fresh pound all right there we go that's better all right so I'm switching to Varget and other than the fact that it runs crappier through a powder measure I guess I could show you that we're whipping it out and playing with it, right? This is a JRB verbose edition, so. All right, so our little super scale. 
bring it back into the party here. And you know what? Just for the heck of it, let's test it again with some check weights. 20.0. No, that's actually a 10. 10.0. 30.0. 30 so it's weighing perfectly. Our first charge of Varget is 24 grains. So I know that's going to be a little bit farther out than our H335 number. Nope, too far. That's 27.8. Yeah, that's the problem with, you know, big extruded stick powders like this is the, the mechanism gets hung up in the powder measure. But when you're trickling them, to, trickling them to final weight, it doesn't matter. All right, so from this point forward, there is nothing new. There is nothing exciting. Just need to weigh out the powder, seat the bullets, and we're on the range. So unless something interesting happens, I'll just see you on the range. Okay, guys, it's time to see if our Bob's bullets are going to shoot. So this is our gun. This is an 18-inch white oak armament. SPR barrel, Silencer Co. Omega suppressor with a Coltac suppressor cover on there that likes to slip a lot. Hopefully it doesn't give us problems today. The rest of the upper parts are Palmetto State Armory. We've got a 4 to 16 by 44 Vortex scope. And I grabbed the lower from my 6.5 Grendel. So we're actually using a uh, Magpul PRS stock and a CMC 3.5 pound trigger. My Caldwell chronograph is out there. Target's out at 100 yards. So let's see if these guys are going to shoot. Okay, first up is 21.0 grains of H335. The gun is completely clean and completely cold right now. Haven't had any warm up shots or uh, anything like that, so we'll see how it goes. Okay, so the sights look good. But I am a big fat idiot and I forgot to uh, open my gas block back up. <laughs> when I was cleaning it, I shut off my adjustable gas block and forgot to open it back up. So I need to go run and get a tool. That piece of brass went nowhere. Which, speaking of that piece of brass, it looks great. No pressure signs to speak of. Okay, let's try this again. That's a pretty good start. Let's see, our velocity was 2469 with a 22.8 feet per second standard deviation. Spread of 58. Okay, no pressure signs on the brass, so we are moving on. 21.5 grains is next. So the shade on the target is making it difficult for me to spot the holes, but that's a that's a good group, isn't it? They're definitely not awful. Okay, next up, 22.0. Twenty two point five. 
pretty incredible performance so far. Last up with H335 is 23.0 grains. Velocity still nice and low, you know, we're in the upper 2600s. So the brass looks fine, but at these velocity levels, you certainly wouldn't expect pressure problems out of H335. So, all right, 23.0. All right, so it all kind of fell apart there at the top end. Huh. Very strange. But let's move on to Hodgden Varget. Our first load is 24.0 grains. Okay, moving on to 24.5. All right, another good group. Tell you what, if you're wondering why I'm not more enthusiastic about shooting these awesome groups with these bullets, I am on the inside. It is so hot out here right now. Temperature in the 90s and the humidity is really bad. So I'm just sweating my butt off. I'm trying to uh, blink sweat out of my eyes between shots and stuff. And it's just hard to, uh, it's hard to comment on what's going on. <laughs> but you know what? The groups are good. So we'll just focus on the shooting out here and then we'll get back to the bench where it's cool and that's where we'll do our celebrating. Everything's good so far, so moving on to 25.0 grains of Argot. Twenty five point five. Okay, no pressure signs, so moving on to twenty six point zero. <laughs> oh god i gotta buy a whole lot more of these bullets before you guys buy them all all right now it's time to work our way back through our varget loads except this time we're at an overall length of 2.260 so 25 thousandths more overall length see if it tightens up these horrible groups any First up, 24.0 grains. Failure to feed there. Huh, that's weird. You know what? I'm an idiot. I forgot. I uh, 
after I finished the 26 grain load earlier, I went down one click on my gas block since all my all my brass was going to about uh, about two o'clock. So that's what happened here. It looks like we only lost about 10 feet per second with the longer overall length. That's good. So let's move on. 24.5 grains. Okay, 25.0. So it doesn't look like this longer overall length, getting them a little bit closer to the lands is really gonna help. 25.5. All right, so much for this uh, gas block setting. I'm gonna have to go back to the old setting on the gas block here. Didn't lock the bolt back. All right, next up, 26.0. Yeah, that, that one didn't feed either. Screw it, I'm gonna have to move it right now. So since our groups at the other overall length were already really good, and it doesn't look like these 2.260 groups are gonna improve on it, I've been trying to shoot a little bit faster to see what might happen to the groups as uh, the gun heats up. This is definitely the hottest I've ever had it. It's warm. It is definitely warm, but still seems to be group, grouping okay. All right, four more shots. All right, finished it off with a good group. So let's get inside where it's cool. Whew. Freaking dying out here. Guys, I swear on my life, I had not shot any of these bullets before. These were my first 75 shots with these bullets. All of the joking around about their website earlier was a genuine reaction to the claims on their website. I thought it was crazy, but these are really, really, really impressive results. Just freaking beautiful. We've got three, three groups here in green that I would consider our best groups of the day. There was our 21.5 grain load with H335. That was not, not bad at all. Everything on the lower end here with uh, 335 looked great. Kind of fell apart there at the top. You know, that, that went a little bit nutty there at the top and opened up to around two inches. But otherwise, yeah, 335 didn't look too bad at all. It's funny how Varga was pretty much the opposite. So I've, like I said, I've got the, the good groups in green here. The top charge, 26.0 grains with both of our Varga tests were our best two groups of the day. At 2.260 inch overall length, yep, our 2.260 inch overall length shot a uh, 0.58 and the 2.235 inch shot a 0.78. And their poor groups, some of theirs that, that got circled red as being our uh, poorer groups, were all down here on the low end. Two inches, or you know, 2.1 inches, 2.3 inches. And then this 1.7 incher wasn't bad, but it just kind of flew one high there. All of these that were bad just kind of had one crazy flyer that uh, screwed up the whole group up here. This one was overall pretty bad, but yeah, that one guy up there really kind of made it worse but overall all of the in-betweens the ones that didn't get a circle the average ones they're all between they're all right between an inch and 1.4 inches 
that's a good shoot bullet because so if you if we go back a couple videos ago where we did the initial break in and accuracy tests of my white oak armament barrel i pulled out three bullets that i knew were crappy that i knew would shoot poor groups the first was the 55 grain varmint nightmare inch and three quarters to two inches the 62 grain ss 109 same deal two inches plus or minus a little bit and then a 64 grain nozzler inch and a half to two inches so crappy bullets still shoot crappy in this gun it's a nice barrel but there's only so much a barrel can do for you so i don't think these results are just because you know they were shot with a nice barrel i think these are good shooting bullets so a couple other things I want to remark on. Velocity was fine, but we've got some room to move up, especially like H335. We should be able to safely get H335 a little bit faster than that. But it kind of looks like accuracy's falling apart on the top end. So, you know, we would need to explore that some more and find out whether that's a trend or if this was a fluke. But if you were looking for uh, a low volume, low cost load, you know, 21 grains of H335 did just fine. If you want to be the guy who uh, goes to the range and says stuff like, man, my crap ammo that I carry loose in ammo can shoots half inch groups, bro. You can be that guy. You can be that guy right here. All it takes is 26 grains of Vargit in this bullet and you can go be a douchebag all over the place, but you'll have the ammo to back it up. How awesome is that? We are going to do a whole lot more work with this bullet here on the channel. This is our new official 223 plinking bullet. I just ordered a thousand more because I don't know how big their operation is. I think the website says it's just, you know, two guys named Bob probably, you know, doing this stuff in their garage or whatever. So if we hit them hard, they may sell out fast. I don't know. I don't know what sort of, uh, you know, what sort of inventory they're keeping over there. So I went ahead and bought another thousand bullets before you vultures get over there. And I'm just looking forward to exploring all sorts of crap with this bullet. I don't know what to think here about our 2.260 inch groups because man, it was getting hot and I was getting tired and I'm afraid that maybe I didn't do the ammo justice, but at the same time, it was fascinating to watch the velocities. We started out on the low end. The 2.260 inch was 11 feet per second slower than the shorter guy. And then it went to nine feet per second, the difference. But then at 25 grains, it totally switched over. And then the 2.260 was faster by 21 feet per second and then 35 and then 54. So just that uh, 25 thousandths of overall length totally changed our velocity curve, which by my understanding, that would mean it totally changed our uh, pressure curve as this uh, load went up. So that's a very good uh, illustration of that effect and why you know if there was one warning i guess i would give about this bullet is that you know at least in my chamber we were reasonably close to the lands so if you're loading for multiple guns or you know loading for your own gun for the first time just make sure to check that you're not uh jamming your rounds into the lands because if you are you can have uh either the bullets getting pushed into the case which causes a lot more pressure being seated deeper or they're jammed into the lands, which can cause pressure problems. So that's one thing to be mindful of. I'm thinking that maybe 2.225 would be just about the right overall length, somewhere between 2.2 and 2.225. It's probably gonna be about where that cantalure lines up just perfect. And we'll do some additional testing to see, you know, accuracy at different overall lengths. But we finally got a really good, cheap platform to test some cool stuff with. So if you want to play along at home, get your butt over there and get you some of these bullets because we're going to we're gonna have a lot of videos featuring these guys. Another thing like crimp. I'd love to do a, a, a 223 crimp video where we found, found ourselves a really good load, good shooting load, and then threw a whole bunch of different crimp levels at it and saw what it did to, uh, did to accuracy. Same thing with overall length. So, so this is our new cheap test bullet. So that was 85 bucks I just paid for a thousand. So shipped i think it was like fixed six dollars of shipping or seven dollars of shipping so shipped to your door for eight and a half cents a piece this is uh this blows my freaking mind man this is the dream <laughs> so i did some quick math with the 26 grains of varget and the eight and a half cents a piece number 
that I just got per bullet from this last order. So that, that puts us at about 22 cents per shot here in this video. But like I said, if you, uh, you know, get a powder that with a lighter charge weight where you get a few more rounds per pound, you know, you could trim that down a bit, go with some cheaper primers. You could trim that down a bit. So outstanding performance for under 20 cents a round is pretty freaking sweet. So total cost for components here for these 75 shots was about $16.50, which leads perfectly into a quick discussion about Patreon. You guys need to come check me out at patreon.com slash reloading. It's the best way to support the channel here. It's based around monthly pledges. So a monthly pledge of $2 would have uh, paid for this video, paid for the components in this video in well under a year. So every little bit helps. It adds up very quickly. A sincere thank you to everybody who's already uh, checked it out and signed up. And I think that wraps up this video. So I will see you guys next time.